is another episode of the Fuzzy Mike. This is the Fuzzy Mike. The interview series without format, without boundaries, without focus. This is the Fuzzy Mike. They have been called the band with the wildest story ever told. Mayhem. Hard to argue that claim when the backstory includes a lead singer named Dead who slashed his own arms, slit his own throat, then blew his head off with a shotgun, left a suicide note that read, excuse all the blood, was found by the band's guitarist and creator Euronymous and drummer Hellhammer. Euronymous took a photo of the bloody corpse and it became the cover for a live bootleg album called The Dawn of the Black Hearts. Also, according to Hellhammer, Euronymous also took a piece of dead skull and made a necklace, as well as making a ham, frozen vegetables, paprika, and brain stew. Oh, and that just scratches the surface. Their legend grew in the 90s when their then-bassist, Count Grishnok, participated in a spate of church burnings across Norway. Putting the exclamation point on this story, Grishnok then murdered founding member Euronymous in the stairwell of his own apartment, stabbing him 23 times. Considered founding fathers of the Norwegian black metal scene, their 1994 album, De Mysteries Dom Satanus, is considered one of the most influential black metal albums of all time. Today, with all of that history behind them, founding bassist Necro Butcher, drummer Hellhammer, singer Attila, and guitarist Ghoul and Teluk continue the band's musical legacy with their 2019 release, Demon, the band's sixth full-length album. I was drawn to Mayhem long before the book Lords of Chaos was ever written. That book has since become a full-length feature movie of the same title. If you want the real story of what truly happened in the early days, then Necro Butcher's account in The Death Archives is the book for you. One of the things I love about hosting the Fuzzy Mike is finding out what people are really like and comparing it with my impression of how I think they are. I've gone on record that throughout my 30-year interviewing career, my favorite interviews have been with Henry Winkler of the Fonz, Keith Urban, and boxing promoter Don King. I now add Mayhem guitarist Telek to that very short list. This was just a downright fun conversation. That's all good. Lazy days. I would imagine so. I mean, compared to what you guys should be doing right about now, which is tearing up the United States, you're, what, stuck in Oslo and under uh, quarantine? Yeah, that's right. So uh, not much to do, I guess. But trying to stay busy and get some work done with uh, these interviews and stuff. So we at least something is going on. Well, you shouldn't have a problem staying busy. I mean, you're you're writing music, you're performing music, you're promoting Demon, the, the October 2019 release, but you're also a very prolific uh, social media guy for, for Mayhem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I am. How is social media helping you uh, in this downtime, especially since you're not out on the road promoting Demon? I don't know. Actually, I'm trying to stay away from it a bit uh, these days and... Uh... Just take care of my girlfriend since uh, I never see her <laughs> much. What, what what are the things you guys like to do? Hang out. Right now, we uh, just watch TV and uh, eat very good food. That's what we've been doing lately. We can't really go out, so we have to stay inside and uh, find things to do. Yeah, you know, I, I love talking to metal musicians because I sometimes think of metal musicians as kind of like being in the sideshow, you know, because it is such a, a niche uh, format. And to hear that, you know, I've got a kid, I've got a girlfriend, I've got a wife. What what do uh, your your significant others think about the way you make your living? No, uh, she's not into metal at all. So uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a strange. It's a strange beast for her. She doesn't understand it much, but uh, of course she respects it. You know, she's well, very supportive. Well, thankfully, uh, because you are quite the Renaissance musician, uh, you're now doing theater. Uh, which you you scored a uh, you scored a play in in uh, Norway is that what it was? Yeah, that's right. I listened to a little bit of it. Uh, it's not your typical opera. It's not your typical theater production. So how'd you get roped into that? Uh, basically, this was a piece by uh, an author called uh, a theater play author that named Bertolt Brecht. He's a German. Uh, uh-huh. He's uh, he's he's been dead for many years, but. Uh, uh, Germany and Bertolt Brecht have this uh, weird uh, relationship where the, it needs to be done the exact way that he thinks. And he also have uh, these people looking after his rights to make that happen. 
So this German director went to Oslo, Norway, to so that he can do whatever he wants because we could never put up this play in uh, Germany with the black metal or metal. So how did uh, coming up with that score? How does that differ from doing the things that you do with Mayhem? The difference was that I got the script for the whole whole thing uh, with the dialogues and shit, and I had the parts where I was, was supposed to make music. So I already had the vibe in the scene. Uh, from when I start before I started to make music, so I know what kind of vibe uh, the scene needed and everything. So that was uh, very cool, actually. I never had the lyrics before I started writing any music before. It was a cool challenge. A yeah, challenge, but an easier process than say doing everything you did for uh, Esoteric Warfare, which is write, produce, write the music, write the lyrics. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was a cool way to to write stuff actually. When you had the lyrics first. Uh, I, actually, I got lyrics from Attila yesterday, I think it was, uh, for the next May, Mayhem album. So we are already looking into uh, starting working on that now, actually. Well, yeah, because I read uh, that you guys had like 90 minutes of material left over from the Demon recording sessions. How much of that is going to make it on the next release, if any? I think, no, I, I think we're going to scrap uh, all the songs from that uh, thing and just move on, move forward a bit. Is it because there's so much similarity between what we're hearing on Demon and you guys want to break away from that and go in a different direction? No, it's more about uh, these 90 minutes that you talk about. It's basically stuff that uh, are turned down. So maybe it's not uh, good enough, you know. But I understand that there's not really a democratic process in Mayhem because you guys don't particularly get along very well. So who makes the decision on what's good enough and what's not good enough? Uh, I don't know. Sometimes we just team up uh, <laughs> towards the people that doesn't like the song and we just trump it through, you know? <laughs> what is So what is the process in a Mayhem song? First, it starts out with uh, either me or Charles, the other guitar player, send out a sketch for a song. And then, uh, yeah, we send out an email with the song and then uh, we get feedback on that. And if we don't get feedback, uh, that means that people don't like it. Instead of telling us they don't like it, they don't answer. <laughs> 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 so it's, uh, yeah, the creative process is not the best in this band. It's very destructible, actually. But yeah, so that's how the way it goes. As soon as we all agree, or most of us agree on uh, what songs we want to play, we head out to the rehearsal place and we try it out and see if it works there, basically. But Demon was kind of a collaborative effort with more people in the band actually helping you out uh, with music and with lyrics too, right? Exactly. Uh, this time we had uh, actually Necro Butcher wrote the lyric, and uh, that's the first time since Death Crush, I believe. Uh, yeah. Also Hellhammer, uh, Hellhammer wrote, wrote one lyric, and we had Charles wrote two or three, I believe. So yeah, everyone uh, put, just put things into the whole shit the whole time. This is a great experience actually. For me it was a very uh, like a bit like almost like we had the band feeling there for a moment. <laughs> 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 so we're, we're talking about how sometimes you guys don't don't see eye to eye or get along and everything and uh i i've seen a few different interviews with you one with necro butcher and ghoul and one with you and ghoul just uh, together and there doesn't seem to be any like hatred or animosity is that all created or is that uh, it's more uh, uh it's more the hatred is more behind the scenes i guess we're not uh, we're trying to act normal when we're around other people <laughs> Actually, uh, how refreshing is it that we've gone uh, nearly eight minutes and we've only mentioned Necro Butcher twice. We've only mentioned Hellhammer once and Attila once. Um, I, I actually am, am very familiar with Mayhem even before Lords of Chaos came out. But you guys have true mayhem. You guys have surpassed that now. Is, is that refreshing for you to not really have to go back and revisit that with every conversation? Yeah, for me, it's, uh, you know, all the, the band's history and stuff. I wasn't there for it, so it's uh, I can't really speak about it either. Uh, I know the history of Mayhem is very important to the band and everything, uh, but it's very relieving to not time to talk about it, be mostly you, because I don't know anything about it, you know. But before becoming a member of Mayhem, you actually were a fan. So obviously you were familiar with, with the lore. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. But you actually turned down an invitation to be in Mayhem before you actually took their gig, right? 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, how do you turn down? How do you turn down an offer from one of your boyhood favorites? No, it's it was basically because I had uh, another job to do. I was uh, playing live guitar for Gorgoroth at the time. Mm-hmm. So Which... we had the tour. We had the tour coming up, so I had to get that out of the way first. Which, uh, how uh, does this make you feel that in 2017, Loudwire did a uh, feature on the 10 most evil bands in the history of music, and Gorgoroth came in two, Mayhem came in one, and you're a member of both. <laughs> I really didn't know that. Yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, Gorgoroth is indeed uh, a very evil band. I can watch for that. What <laughs> Watain was also on that uh, on that list, and you have actually toured with them before. Uh, what makes them particularly evil? I think the their seriousness about what they're doing. I think that makes them uh, very evil. They don't fuck around. They're not, nothing is made up. Nothing is uh, for uh, to show off or to be funny or anything. So it, I guess that makes them <laughs> especially evil. <laughs> We're going to talk about your fans here in just a moment, but uh, I've been nervous about this conversation because Mayhem fans are so rabid. And <laughs> I, I, well, and, and I'm going to just go out flat out and say it. Um, Watain came to Houston, I believe, in tw- early 2019. And I had read about the concert reviews from other shows. And tell like, I got to got to be honest, man, I pushed out on going because I was afraid. <laughs> really? Yeah. But for <laughs> some strange reason, I'm. Um, for some strange reason, I'm shedding tears that you guys aren't going to be here in April on the uh, Decibel Tour with a bath. And uh, yeah, it is what it is. You know, uh, it's not much we can do uh, other than uh, we're trying to move things around so we can come back uh, soon. I guess. Are you optimistic about your August performance in Las Vegas? I think uh, maybe not actually, but uh, we haven't heard anything uh, in anything else about it uh, so, so far that I know. It's still going on, but looking at how this thing is progressing, I doubt it will happen, actually. But I hope, that, I really hope it will, because we never played Las Vegas before. You have played the States before, and I remember a quote saying that playing the States is like icing on the cake. How so? No, it's always... Uh, no, this, the, the audience in America are uh, very good. There's a good audience over there, and uh, always good vibes. And uh, we love touring, you know... Um, we love touring America. It's just very different from Europe. You uh, did get to go out and do some shows early in 2020 uh, in promotion of Demon. In particular, you were in uh, Israel, I believe also Istanbul, and you went to do four or five shows in Russia. What are those audiences like? Uh, Russian uh, Russian fans are crazy. Um, and this time we played for the first time in Sibir as well, actually. Uh, and and that, there, there we had the most violent audience, actually. There are crazy motherfuckers over there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say violent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How so? Fight, what? Fight, they fighting the whole time and headbanging and crashing around. Fucking great show. So I, I, I want to go back to a uh, Facebook post you made in December uh, talking about the time that you were doing a festival and Celtic Frost was on stage. And you say now that you are not as fun as you were back then. You're not as extreme as you were back then. What changes? <laughs> the age, I guess. <laughs> but, but how does age change a guy who's been in two of the most evil bands in history? You know what I think it is? I, I stopped drinking hard liquor. Ah, wait a minute now. I saw an interview <laughs> with you when you were in Austin and you said Jack Daniels is a uh, is a vice of yours when you come over to the States. Yeah, well, that's from 2017. <laughs> <laughs> so in a matter of two and a half years, we have gone from Jack Daniels to teetotaler, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's going to save me some money because uh, when you guys come to Houston, I was going to have some Jack Daniels already for you. But okay, <laughs> I'll get, I, I'll, I'll break out the prune juice for you, Telic. I still drink, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Now, let's talk about Mayhem fans. How cool is it for you to have fans draw and paint pictures of you and send them to you? Well, that's uh, something for me that's uh, new. Uh, well, it's kind of exploded last couple of years. Uh, I never had that much before. I had some, but not not as much as now. Uh, I think it's it's uh, very humbling to you know people are sitting there spending hours on drew- drawing you. It's uh, amazing. Do you keep all of them? Yeah, the ones that I get uh, physical copies of, I keep. Uh-huh. I got. It, I actually got them in my shelter. <laughs> 
<laughs> really? <laughs> True story. <laughs> True story. And what, 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 what does your girlfriend think about all of those pictures that, that people are making for you? No, she, she thinks, she, uh, thinks it's very cool. Uh, she's actually the one that hangs them up there. I'm assuming that it would be the alternative of getting nudie photos sent to you via email or something. Yeah, exactly. Luckily, yeah. that doesn't happen. Yeah, no, so pop stars and rock stars get bras and crap thrown at them on stage. You guys get self-portraits from artists. I, I would I would go with the latter rather than the former as far as uh, being uh, being fans. That's pretty damn cool. Yeah, we get, uh, <laughs> we get drawings and, uh, I don't know, animal skulls and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, take me to the progression of this. Uh, how does Samantha Fox and AHA lead to um, falsified and hated. What is that progression? I don't know. That's a very fast <laughs> fast way no, to that... put it like that. But yeah, that was my first musical uh, inspirations, I think, you know, where, where I actually start listening for real to music or looking at tits, maybe for Samantha Fox. I don't know. <laughs> but, well, uh, yeah, she was. Uh, Samantha Fox was a was a pinup girl. That's exactly. I think that was what you said got you into it was the cover art. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's hard for me to know uh, what happened in between uh, uh, a hey and <laughs> false <laughs> and hated. Well, but Metallica was in there somewhere. Yeah, no, a little bit. You know? <laughs> no, no, Metallica was in Metallica and Death was maybe the ones that shaped me as a guitarist at least. Do you remember what song gra it gravitated to towards the guitar and and, and what? You're like, oh man, this is what I want to do. Uh, right now, I have no idea. What's left for you to do? I mean, it, you've been in many, many successful bands. You're now in the band that pretty much defined black metal. Yeah, for me, I just feel I landed, uh, you know, this is home for me. So I thrive in this band. So I'm not planning on doing anything else uh, in, the, in the future. So I hope that we will last for another 30 years. <laughs> Can you believe Mayhem's been around 30 years? It's 35 years, man. 35. Yeah. yeah. I talked to uh, I talked to Victor from uh, from Dark Fortress the other day, and they too are celebrating, you know, 25, 30 years. What is the staying power of Norwegian black metal bands in such a niche format? What do you attribute know, that to? It's just, no, it's for us. It's uh, it's kind of a lifestyle, you know, and you. You can't suddenly just change that. So it's just something we need to do in a way. It's, just, it's our freedom in a way to get to do this. So when you're taking the stage uh, and you transform from your given name into Teluk, your stage name, what is that transformation both physically and mentally? Deep down, it's it's not that much difference actually. This The, the stage persona, it's just, uh, it comes from me, you know, who I really am, so it's not that big difference. And, and how long does it take you to get ready for a stage show? Uh, I don't know, 15 minutes maybe? That's it? Yeah. yeah. You look bored as hell at soundcheck. Oh, I fucking hate it. Yeah. Then why do it? No, we need, uh, we need to tune the PA and get uh, the room uh, okay. ready for our sound you know, and everything. But it's, uh, we also use soundcheck to rehearse the songs because some some people in the band don't rehearse at, ho at home, so then we used uh, <laughs> that sound check for rehearsal. <laughs> How often do you play when, when you're not on the road and when you're not in the studio? No, we, we never rehearse. Uh, but you yourself, though? No, I never rehearse. Really? Uh, no, I don't so, like it. I, I like to play music. I like to create stuff. Uh, I hate rehearsing. So how long does it take for you to create? a riff or or a lyric or are they just are you see it's one of those things where if you're looking for it you're not going to find it it just has to hit you is that similar to songwriting yeah i mean if i'm not inspired i don't sit down and try to do anything uh because then i know that most of the stuff that will come out of me is just crap anyway so i just don't do it will this so, yeah. uh will this virus in the in the quarantining is that going to maybe be a, a, a subject that that mayhem takes on down the road I don't know. I think, yeah, I think not actually. I, I read that you said that you would like to write a song about oil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In what I, respect? I can't, <laughs> I can't really explain it. Uh, I have I have some notes written down somewhere about it. Uh, I had this feeling about being drowned in oil or something. I'm not sure. Uh, I can't really explain it. But yeah, well, that's true. I, I really wanted to make an album about oil. 
Well, the way prices are on oil right now, it probably wouldn't be too expensive to drown in a barrel of oil because they're like selling for like 15, 20 bucks a, a pop there. So, yeah, for Norway being based on oil, selling oil, I know this very well. <laughs> dude, same, same in Houston, man. Our, our, our economy, uh, so goes oil, so goes the Houston economy. Yeah, same here, man. You're fucked. <laughs> when you play festivals, like, will, it will, will Hell, Hellfest, will it happen this year? I don't know. I hope so because that's, I think that's, uh, yeah, we're playing there this year. So I hope it's happening. Yeah, you're, you're playing that, uh, Psycho Fest in, uh, in Las Vegas. Have you, you've played Hellfest before, right? Yeah, I played there with, uh, played it four or five times, maybe. Yeah, it's one of the show, it's one of the, co- uh, one of the festivals that I, I hope to get to in my lifetime. What is it like? It's a, it's a very good festival. Uh, have you been to any European festivals before? I have not. Okay, so no. you have you have uh, that one and. Uh, well, Vakken would be the other one, right? Vak, Vakken, yeah. But I think uh, Hellfest is kind of better, actually. How so? I don't know. There's no Germans there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. No, I don't know. I don't know. It's just just a different kind of vibe at Hellfest. Uh, it's also a little bit fresher since it's the newer than. Uh, Wacken. Yeah. But both of them both of them are cool, you know, and Wacken is an experience by itself, uh, that's for sure. Lots of freaky stuff going on there. But yeah, uh, my favorite is Hellfest amongst those two at least. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys. I seriously hope you get to come over here and play Vegas. As you said, you've never played it before and, um, you know, uh, I, I hope they reschedule the, the, the tour with you and a bath and we're in idle hands. Uh, that was going to be a spectacular tour. Yeah, yes. Uh, I hope that uh, we'll still come back with all the ba- all the bands that you just mentioned to do this. We can go on your website and buy the uh, the tour merch, though, can't we? Yes, please do so because we have tons of uh, merch <laughs> that we haven't paid yet, and we owe we owe <laughs> about forty two thousand dollars <laughs> in merch bills. So yeah, forty two thousand. <laughs> I mean, you're just out of that, or yeah? Wow. All right. Well. <laughs> Here, here's what we need to do. We need to go on to uh, the Mayhem website. We need to go uh, buy as much merchandise as possible. You guys got some killer stuff on there, from ladies' t-shirts to hoodies to uh, to long sleeve shirts to actually a COVID nineteen Mayhem mask, which is very very smart. Yeah, uh, we we got all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many followers do you have now on Facebook? Because I know you're you're hoping to you're over forty thousand. You're hoping to get up to where Nurgle is. Oh my! On my Instagram, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Forty-one thousand now. Woohoo! Any, any special plans when you when you uh, take over the uh, the behemoth? Yeah, then I'm gonna release a polk album. <laughs> <laughs> How long will we uh, have to anticipate that? When do you think you'll overtake him? But the speed of this, never. So uh, maybe I'm off the hook. <laughs> you know, I, I really appreciate the conversation. I, I'm, I'm sure that the uh, the mayhem fanatics are going to beat the hell out of me because uh, you know I just kind of talk to folks as as a conversationalist, you know, and and I just like to learn about your life and learn about uh, about the the process that goes into a mayhem song and and all that kind of stuff. So you know, this no. has been great. I, hopefully, it was for you. Yeah, like was uh, really like to see you and good luck with the. Uh, rest of your day hope to see you in august in vegas Telek, thanks so much man tell Likewise. everybody hi all right okay, okay. take care bye bye my thanks to Telok and to claire reynolds at the orchard and century media records the fuzzy mike executive producer is trish klein social media director is lisa tynan production elements zach sheesh at the radio farm i'm kevin klein don't forget to follow us on facebook twitter instagram and the fuzzy Thank you for listening to this episode. We'll see you next time on The Fuzzy Mike. Fuzzy Mike. Thanks for listening to The Fuzzy Mike. Check back often and stay fuzzy. Wait a second. Did we read that right? Stay fuzzy?